And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. <laughs> I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a returning good brother to the temple. Current the ma the madman beh behind su behind such works as Dungeon a Day, as well as the as well as revamping his Eternity TTRPG system. The one and only Jacob Tegman. How are you doing today, man? So good, man. Thank you for having me back on. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Yeah, thank you, thank you for being open to coming back. Um, oh, I know it's been quite a while since I had you on previously. Yeah. In fact, it was. Let's see. It's. It was about two years ago that I first had you on. Oh, Dang. I think yeah, that I was went. Still using fast. Skype around that time. Uh huh. And there's. I'd, ima I'd imagine that there's been some up, some ups and downs in the t in the time since. Yeah, for for the eternity and game design, all mm -hmm. the stuff we're doing, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> yeah, really, it's basically at a point where it's starting to become no longer a side project. And so uh, it's it's fun to be taking, I guess, further steps into the looks of the game and the artwork and I would just say the overall professionalism. But... Mm -hmm. Yeah, ups and downs with that for sure. Yeah, I remember. I remember back then there was there was an idea, but but um, right. <laughs> it, but it was still oh, it was still a ways. Um, totally. And of course, the site itself has vastly um, vast has vastly changed since the last time I looked. I looked into it. For sure. Yeah. Yeah, and you provided some great feedback, you know, a couple of years ago, I remember. So mm -hmm. I just want to, yeah, thank you again for the help that you've given me and helped advance the game. So, yeah, thank you. I, I, it's, it's what I do. I drink and I know things. Sure. <laughs> uh, but I think one, I think one of the big, th one of the big things is. When I, I remember when I first dis, my first um came across Eternity, it there, yeah there were de there were definitely ideas, but it had but it hadn't quite gotten a direction, and obviously the art has helped nail down that direction. But one thing yeah. that I I think I neglected to ask about is what sort of media would you say is the appendix N of Eternity, if you're familiar with that term. Can you, yeah, maybe tell me a little bit more so I can make sure to answer correctly. Um, in old, in very early D and D, Appendix N was this section in the back of the books that mm -hmm. was this collection of re of further re further reading, inspirational re media, that yeah. kind of thing. Um, oh, okay. That you usually included uh, um, books, film, what what have you. Um. White Wolf has something similar called inspir called a, se a section called inspirational media, but appendix yeah. has become kind of the shorthand for that concept. Um, what would you say is in append? What would you say would be in the appendix end for um, eternity? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I started game designing, you know, I mean, obviously very badly when I was a kid, and mm -hmm. so <laughs> it was just like being my siblings play games like final fantasy. Mm -hmm. Um, and then as I got older, I didn't have access to dungeons and dragons because it just wasn't as, you know, like you couldn't buy it at target 25 years ago. <laughs> so, um, at least I, I wasn't able to find it. So D and D what I thought D and D was, you know, was an inspiration. And then when I finally got my hands on it later in life, um, I studied it quite a bit and then probably the the final you know sort of major inspiration for it would have been games like world of warcraft where i felt like the games 
were complex but very simple and accessible in ways that you know maybe D and D. Um, I think it's getting a lot better with the recent versions, but at that time, like three point five edition, you know, you had to read like three hundred pages to understand what the hell was going on. So <laughs> probably those three major categories. Mm-hmm. Uh, and since you brought since you brought up Final Fantasy, and as somebody who's developing his his own Final Fantasy project, um, <laughs> it drawing upon just drawing upon that is a is a very wide net oh um, man yeah so would you say would you say that you lean more into the um more more into the the snes era when it comes to using final fantasy re- as a reference for eternity yeah I, I think it would have started probably with seven um so probably like playstation one mm-hmm. um and and just to you know quickly derail you were creating a Final Fantasy project. Is that? Did I hear that correctly? Yes, I've been doing that okay. for about two years. Oh, okay. Well, I don't want to, uh, like I said, derail too much, but I would love to hear more about that. So, yeah, that's that's a that is a whole, that is a whole um a, a whole <laughs> other story. But um, sure, sure. Um, I think one one of the things that's kind that's kind of stood out to me, and this was present. To a to a point, the last time I talked, last time I talked with you, yeah, was the um, what were these little um, car- these little cards for tone mo- monsters and and the like, especially for the adventures, like things like the story element cards, yeah, um, because I've I've been very I've been very critical of one narrative that a lot of D and D adherents um, tend to have, and some GURPS adherents, but I will always pick on GURPS adherents because anybody anybody who talks to me about D and D being too complicated, I will I will break out my copy of GURP, of GURPS or Hero oh, System man. and beat I them agree. with it. Because yes. yeah, 100%. I'm not sure if you've seen Hero System Sixth Edition, but character creation is this is the size of is the size of two <laughs> core books in other games. <laughs> my God. Like, I, oh man, I like I like Hero System. I lo- I love me some champions, but yeah, um, but when you but um, you need multiple session zeros for that kind of thing. And once somebody right. starts breaking out the expansion books, um, it becomes a cry for help. Yeah. Oh. Um, yeah. But the narrative a lot of people tend to tend to have is this idea of you can use. D and D to run any kind of fantasy, mm. and this is one of those ca- this is one of those cases where someone can be technically correct but still wrong. Yeah, I'd agree because, like I, I a lot a good amount of my players didn't grow up with with Conan. They they grew up with martial arts flicks and they grew up with samurai flicks and eventually uh, manga and and so forth. Sure. And consider th- cons- Here's a bit of a pop quiz. What is the okay. most common way to equip a fighter? Uh are you talking about like if I was a player and my character was a fighter, what's the most common way to equip them? Yeah. In terms uh, of weapons. Yeah, I mean, it probably just like a big sword and then a short sword and a shield as like a separate option, and maybe like a bow. Yeah. Well, yeah, the the most and between and between all that, the most common approach is sword and board. Um, yeah, sure, sure. How are you? How are you going to do that? It in if if somebody if somebody wants to run something a little bit more Japan themed, where shields aren't really right. a thing, right? Or the f- or the fact that, and if if I'm running something that's a little bit more India flavored, the mm. sword isn't the weapon that has the biggest cultural footprint. Right, it's the bow. And these are and when people when people say that you can use it to run anything, with enough house ruling, yeah, you probably could. But sure. there comes a point where how where it becomes less of house ruling and and more of, uh, and and more of you 
essentially essentially becoming a full on designer in and of itself. <laughs> uh, yeah, least, there yeah. have been plenty I... of games that house ruled their way that house ruled their way into existence out of other games. Um, yeah. Role Master comes to mind, mm. but I've always had the philosophy: house ruling should be a spice, not the main dish. Right, and I like a, I like a little bit of pepper in my steak, but a little bit does not mean an entire <laughs> ma- an entire container's worth of nothing but pepper. Right, you know we're, put, we're putting so much <laughs> putting so much spice on your on your um on your di- on your dinner that it becomes it becomes less of a less of less of a di- less of a dinner plate and more of a a miniaturized spice rack. Yeah, totally. Uh, and with these sort, with these sorts of story, with these sorts of story elements, and doing and doing the world, doing the world creation, yeah. The correct me if I'm wrong, but the vibe that you're going with is it, it's still fantasy, but making but making it so that the game can be bent into ways where, um. Where it's not just all on the GM to ma- to make the to make the kind of world that is that is needed for the game. Yeah, it's it's a great question. Um, it's one that I'll I'll dive into a little bit of the game design theory. So why I chose that, I think first off, a group of people is always better at coming up with creative ideas than a single person. Um, and that's, you know, I, I've been the dungeon master, like, my entire life. <laughs> so I feel like I'm very good at it, um, having made games especially. But even when I would play, all of our best campaigns have always come about when I've listened the most to my players and used what they thought was happening in the campaign as inspiration for what would what would actually come about. So... Um, with Eternity, the main goal is to allow for multiple uh, game masters. We call them game designers um, because you are literally designing the game. You're designing the world. You're designing the story in it. And what I find is that most groups still don't, like, they still like the idea of one person sort of heading everything up. I think that's that's what has worked best, you know, in the TTRPG genre forever. There's a reason why D and D has stuck with, you know, like the one dungeon master. Um, but these story element cards, the chapter notes, these are really just things that like any, uh, dungeon master would do probably in their own campaign. Like, especially if they're newer to it, like maybe with yourself and with myself, maybe I don't take as many notes now because I, like, I really know what I'm doing, but I've always found that my best ideas come out when I'm really writing down, you know, the intricacies of how I want to foreshadow things and how I want some of these plots to be revealed over the course of the campaign. And I kind of plan a little bit. Um, obviously, you can't plan everything because then you're railroading your players, but that's basically what these uh, campaign character sheets, if you will, in, are intended to do is help people who want to contribute to the game's story do so in a way that allows them to clearly convey their ideas, um, create a cohesive campaign with other game designers as well, so it doesn't devolve into chaos, and um, basically plot out a campaign in the broad strokes so that you have the best chance possible of utilizing all those great creative ideas from the whole group so i I don't know if that uh answered your question exactly but yeah that that was kind of the intent with all of that Mm -hmm. um and i i and this this applies just as much with the with the um uses of races and uses of um classes and some of the classes we had sure I think I think we're pr- I think we're present originally, but it looks like there's been a significant amount more than there was than there was um, previously. So previously, I'm, I'm trying to remember exactly. Um, 
we, after playtesting a lot and doing everything possible to simplify the game, I actually took a lot of the game's classes, um, items, etc., and we're pulling that out. We pulled it out of the main game, and we'll be putting it into a very inexpensive expansion. Um, I just wanted to make the core rulebook as accessible as possible. Um, so with that, there probably are, yeah, some changes to classes especially. Mm-hmm. And because because of that because of that yeah um i think one one of the things i'd like to dive into is i guess, i guess for lack of a bit for lack of a better term um a bit of a bit of word association with the with the various classes um sure so essentially I will go, I will go th- I'm going to go through each um and I'd like you to give I'd like you to give me a a char- a character or or a character from any form of media um that would be in your, that would make for a good representative of that particular sure. class. <laughs> that sounds fun. <laughs> sure. All right. So First, the um, alchemist. Oh, okay. Yeah, so the alchemist will be an expansion class. Mm-hmm. Um, it probably is something like <laughs> what you would find from Full Metal Alchemist. Mm-hmm. Uh, although with some differences, because, you know, um, Al and his brother can do a lot, obviously. So, um, but yeah, that, that was one of the main inspirations. So let's, let's go with full metal. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually, actually I'm going, I'm going to focus. That was my mistake. I, for, I forgot that was an expansion class. That was yeah, an yeah, no worries. Class. I'm going to focus on the ones that are in the book that's available. So first, got it. Um, cool. The assassin. Yeah. Um, if I can, can I break genres? Like, can I say yeah, James I Bond? <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> is that is that a bad answer? <laughs> no, okay. no. There's there are no there are no bad answers with this. I don't want I don't want to carry the implication that it has to be fantasy with the um, answers. Oh, okay, cool. But I guess just to clarify for anybody listening to though, you know, Eternity is a fantasy game. Um, it, it comes with a sort of set series of lore, mostly contained within like the races classes, but. So James Bond would probably be a bad answer in that regard, but <laughs> if you can envision like the type of person character that he is, that's what that would be. So, mm-hmm. yeah. See that that I can I can certainly vibe with. Cool, cool. Uh, um. See, next would be the um, Berserker. Yeah, so definitely like guts from the Berserk series. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, us- I usually end up he- hearing um, that. Yeah, of course. Mm-hmm. So iconic. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll t- I'll take I'd say it, I'd say it's a nice change of pace from hearing Conan for for sure. years for years on end. Sure. Um, <laughs> Is when it comes to when it comes to the concept of a berserker, the there's there's been that um, there, because of the Conan effect, there's been this idea that they should not that they should not be wearing any armor. Mm. Mm-hmm. Which in in a in a in a low in a low tier sword sword and sorcery approach, I. Sp- where we're getting we're getting metal is not easy. I could see that. Sure. Um. But he, but but it's kind it's kind of hard to make that argument when Conan has worn armor in the in the comics and even in the books. Sure. Um. I think it's because pe- most people's exposure to Conan begins and ends with the Schwarzenegger movie. Of course, right. But 
Yeah, I'm all about kind of breaking or at least bending, you know, like the rule, the quote unquote unspoken rules of like expectations around something. So, um, yeah, like in eternity, a, a berserker can be a lot of things. And I like it too, you know, whether you're wearing heavy armor, no armor, or you're like a mage berserker, like that's fun, you know, people, I think uh, the ability to use your creativity is, is what makes a lot of these games fun to begin with, so. Mm-hmm. So the ne- the next one on the list would be the Cryomancer. Yeah, I'd probably go with uh, Elsa from Frozen. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, I could, I could certainly, I could certainly see, I could certainly see it. Um, sure, I'm pro- I would probably end up leaning more towards Sub Zero, but that's just me. Oh yeah, good point. Yeah, I hadn't even thought about that. Even though I have to keep correcting people when they, even though I, I'm, I've been validated in recent years because because every, everybody has made the assumption that sub that Sub Zero is also a ninja. Mm. He's not. The only one who, the only one in that in that the main one in that particular crowd who's a who's a ninja in the Mortal Kombat games is Scorpion. Sure. Oh, but. Next, um, Druid. And I can't look at Druid without hearing the mystery of the Druids. Oh, I'm actually... This is, like, embarrassing to say that I don't, I'm not familiar. So. The, the mystery of the Druids is a infamous meme of it, of an adventure, of an adventure game. Oh, okay. You've no, you've no doubt seen memes of, of the cover. <laughs> okay, yeah, I probably have. <laughs> I can kind of see where this is going, at least, mm-hmm. so... Yeah, um, Druid. I mean, I I always have just thought of like a shape shifting mage. Mm-hmm. Um, trying to think of like what you know a pop culture reference would be, but um, I mean, I don't even the D and D movie. I thought did a pretty fun job with that chick who could turn into like an owl bear. Oh right, the, yeah. oh right, honor among thieves. Yep. Yeah. You have to, yeah. There's been so there's been multiple D and D movies right, over the right. years, so you, yeah, you have one. to be my bad. <laughs> yeah, um, even though I will maintain the only true D and D movie is Darkness Rising. <laughs> I've never seen it, uh, but of course, come across it. So, mm-hmm. although, well, the, well, the the first theatrical attempt back in the early two thousands was cute, at least, and it did give us Jeremy Irons being a, being a giant ham. I never saw that. Sounds great, though. Mm-hmm. But um, fallen paladin. Yeah, maybe uh, like Mordred from any, maybe not any, uh, but what is that one movie called? So obviously, there's lots of movies in the like Merlin, you know, world of fantasy, right? Mm-hmm. Arthur and Merlin, Sword in the Stone. Um, there's one movie that I forget what it's called, but um, Mordred's, you know, basically the uh, the son of Arthur in that one, and um, Queen Mab is like this deity, ancient deity who teaches him to overthrow Arthur's kingdom. So, anyways, great, great movie, whatever it's called. <laughs> Apologies to everybody who like can't Camelot. think of the name of it. Is that it? Yeah, if that's the if that's the one I'm thinking, it is. Yep. Okay. Okay, um, but yeah, I think Fallen Paladin and Mordred. Not not that he, in the one I'm thinking of at least, has like a lot of magical powers, um, but you know, it fits the vibe for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I can see it. the um, The next one on the on my list is Judge. Yeah, this was sort of modeled originally after the Judge characters within Final Fantasy XII. Um, and as the class has developed into being its own thing in, in the Eternity world, I'm not sure if it really fits that anymore. Um, so I'm trying to think of... I, I'm not really sure, like, the kit of abilities that the judge have... Judge has. I'm not sure, like, what a pop culture reference would be. 
Um, except for, I mean, maybe it has like some Death Knight kind of vibes, uh, like from World of Warcraft, maybe. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd also, what comes to mind for me is the judge from, or the, the judges from Judge Dredd. Okay, yeah, that's a movie I, I haven't seen, um, but you, people have told me, so you may be right about that. Yeah. Huh. If you end up watching, I I will always re recommend people to watch the more recent one with Carl Urban instead of the Stallone one. Okay, cool. Good to know. The Stallone one is cute, but even Stallone had, had admitted that that was a bit of a missed opportunity. Um, mm. And it doesn't quite it the problem that it, the problem is that it plays itself kind of um straight mhm mm uh because, because the whole the whole the whole gimmick with with judge dread is taking the cop on the edge motif from say dirty harry and asking what if he was actually legally allowed to do all the shit that he did gotcha sure uh, no, it was meant. It was meant. It's meant to be this extreme parody of the cop on the et, on the edge motif. Gotcha. But um, the next one on the list is the Legionnaire. Uh, so this. Let's see. Um, so it. In any other kind of game, it would be like the commander character as opposed to like the fighter. So, hmm. Yeah, I guess I'm not. Doing a great job with the pop references today. I'm not really sure what that would but, demand. Popular, hmm. but yeah. I get the vibe that it's that it's meant to embody that um, frontline commander archetype. Yeah, yeah. So this, I mean, maybe this would be like Gladiator, but before he's in the arena, like when he's actually on the battlefield, you know. Um, Commanding the troops, and then he actually gets in the fight himself a little bit. Like, mm -hmm. you know, that's probably it. Yeah, I could, I could certainly see that. Uh, the next, the next one I have is um, Oracle. You know what? What comes to mind for me is that same. I, I think the movie's actually called Merlin. I think the one I'm thinking of, anyways. I mean, there's obviously, you know. Camelot. That that wasn't a movie. That was probably a mini, that was a mini series. I think there was. I think there was a movie though. I, I don't know, man. Okay, my bad. I'll let it go. But mm -hmm. um, <laughs> there was a guy in that movie. His he was called like the soothsayer, and he was like the king's, you know, the king's soothsayer, and he was like his advisor. But he was actually terrible at what he did. You know, he would like take out his little bag of stones and roll it on the ground and try and prophesy what would happen. Mm -hmm. um, but he was awful at it and you know, barely escaped with his life, basically. Um, so the Oracle would be like that guy, but with actually the ability <laughs> to do what he's supposed to do. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I could I could certainly see that. Uh, it is... It's hard... It's, it's difficult to have a prediction a prediction based... Um, archetype because yeah um th because of the improvised nature of a ta of a tabletop game yeah and yeah a lot of t a lot of times the that that particular prediction um ends up being a glorified version of the um of the hint button in it in an old adventure game <laughs> exactly yeah that's what all the D, D spells of that nature do yep um and of course, it depends on the G on the GM being able to reliably come up with that kind of stuff, come up with that those kind of hints on the fly, without mm -hmm. making it too obvious. Yeah, I think one reason it may work a little better in Eternity is because someone playing the Oracle, they they could be co game designing, you know, maybe with the main person, and so they have a little more say in what happens, and they can coordinate, you know, with that. Of the other game designers mm -hmm. um, so that you can kind of like say, you know, this is what my character sees and then it actually, you know, could come to pass exactly that way. Um, or, you know, throw in your own twists. But I, yeah, it probably works a little bit better in Eternity for that reason. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Uh, especially, especially since there, especially since there's uh, there's other um a, there's other aspects, including a lot of um support aspects from what I see with your oracle. Uh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I tried to take kind of a broad um, view on what an oracle could do or should do, and so like the spell called Doom, for example, where, mm -hmm. you know, someone just dies in three turns, like, you're sort of, like, <laughs> saying, like, I'm prophesying your death in three turns, and then it happens, right? So, like, you can kind of play around as a as a player with of that class type and try and make it seem pretty easily, I think, with a lot of the spells, like, you predicted this would happen, and then it did. So... Mm -hmm. The equivalent of... Of um jo of Jonathan Joestar going next, you're going to say, and that and that's exactly what you end up saying. Sure, yeah. <laughs> Al along with along with the along with the other patented um Joestar school of combat, running away. Right. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, just this last winter, I saw the first parts of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But um, then there's the paladin, which I mean, it's I've, I suppose I suppose if there's an, if there's one benefit to the paladin design that you have, it's the fact that you don't run the risk of that guy. Oh yeah, being the uh, like the <laughs> like back to the recent D and D movie, that paladin. Who's um, strictly inherent to his code, and is that what you're saying? Or paladins? Be paladins became a problem class for a long time ago because of the of the fact that um, at some point alignment became a mora became a morality system. I don't, yeah. I don't think it was ever designed for it. And you have the situations where some GMs, because they want to be assholes. Mm -hmm. um, Put the paladin in situations where they either violate their moral co their moral um, te tenet and have to fall and become a blackguard or die. Yeah, I hear what you're saying for sure. And because of the emphasis on their um, on that moral code, they end up having a um, mechanics um, mandated reason for being a dick. Yeah, inflexibility. Yeah, yeah. So back to my whole enjoyment of really breaking or at least bending archetypes. Um, one of the first paladins in like the eternity campaigns we created was like an evil paladin. And so he wasn't really evil. He just, you know, like enjoyed lying and doing other terrible things to people sometimes. But he was also like a champion of good. And so it was just fun playing with that. And, um, yeah, there's no penalties in eternity for playing a paladin however you want to play it. You know, it's it's just like you... It, like, the, the definition of the word paladin just means champion. And so you're just becoming a champion of whatever you want. Um, and, you know, I, I think, <clears throat> like, Fallen Paladin, obviously we talked about, kind of has this idea behind it that it would be the blackguard of eternity. But, you know, similarly, I think life is complex and people are complex and so we want to reflect that in the game mm -hmm. that de that definitely makes sense um, there's been there's been plenty of um well let, well the term pa the term paladin is just the was just charlemagne's champions in the matter of france mhm mm uh, and and trying to trying it's one of those things where it's be, where it's best not to overcomplicate it. Um, I agree. And I suppose I suppose this is where yeah. You have I think, the, go ahead. I yeah. suppose this is where you have the advantage of not having a dedicated quote unquote spell list. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Like in D and D, where you have like access to certain. Spells is that what you're talking about? Yeah, because 
of course, pa because the whole thing of paladins being a being having to be a gish when you have that dedicated spell list. But when everybody's mm -hmm. just when spells are just everybody's um are just the are just a form of class action. You don't really have to worry about that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the next one on the list, of course, is the pyromancer. Yeah, um, my wife introduced me to the Winx saga. Uh, I don't know if that's a really popular one other people have seen. I thought it was great. Um, it was kind of silly, but, you know, it was, it was fun. And the main character is basically a pyromancer in that, so. Mm -hmm. uh, and barring that, we can, we can always invoke the Human Torch again. Yeah, of course. Yep. Yeah, there's more popular ones, for sure. Mm -hmm. But... Since since the sub, but since you have a power a pyromancer and a cryomancer and bo and, and the pyromancer has the subtitle "Born of the Summer Solstice," um, yeah, it ends up reminding me of an analogy that forests do not care about the winter seasons, or the, hmm. the uh, middle seasons, I should say. They only care about summer and winter. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I'd never heard that before, but I make it makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But Eve but um of course next would be the Royal Guard, which some would which I'm guessing would be the would be akin to a lot of knight archetypes. Yes, I think that's a good way to look at it. Yeah. Yeah, I could I could certainly um, see, I could certainly see it. Um, and as far as the, um, as far as the sage, would you say that that's more for people who, um, want more casting in their casting? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, sage is probably like the cleric or the priest class from a lot of other games. Mm -hmm. Um, and then like similarly, the Royal guards, like the shield fighter character, you know, so there, there were, there were a couple classes. There are a couple classes in eternity where <clears throat> I wanted to give people who really wanted to dive into like one aspect of play, you know, one archetype of play, um, like an entire class to experience that as opposed to just like equip a shield. And now you're like this or you know if you want to be a healer just play this class that kind of heals so these are like the dedicated classes i would say mm -hmm. um and i'm i'm guessing with um summoner that's built around the some that's built around the summoner jobs that you would see in final fantasy yeah yeah so there's kind of two main ways to play it it's like either you s literally summon like a gigantic thing that fights for you uh, continually, or you know, Final Fantasy tactic style, you quote unquote summon something that just like blasts the entire <laughs> battlefield. Mm -hmm. uh, you kind of get your choice there. And as as an aside, I sh I should note that it, that there's one smart move that you've done, in and that is, um splitting off a lot of the aspects that would normally be in the category of fighter. Because mm -hmm. the problem the problem with the f the problem with the fighter as as just a class is how broad that is. Being good yeah. being good with weapons. Yeah, yeah, you have the whole you can equip any weapon, but most people aren't going to be using a variety of weapons when they equip their right. character. They're mm -hmm. largely going to stick with one particular way to equip their character, and that's it. Mm -hmm. And that's not a condemnation on people who do that. It's just that it's just a um, habit. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you saying that. I, yeah, I mean, we'll get to another class in a minute here where I, maybe I'll talk about it more. But, um. There's always like this line with games, like, do I provide more rules that will give people like 
uh, more options or do I keep it simple? I And I think that um, sometimes trying to keep it simple, like with a D&D fighter, you actually end up having so many options of weapons and feats and things you could do, you know, that it, it can be a little overwhelming when you're not guided as much. So part of it was like, let's build classes that kind of break out these functions and then explore those functions in more detail um, for people who want to do play that kind of character, but not have to come up with everything on their own, I suppose. So, mm-hmm. oh. and what it's, there's, it's also the, it's also the fact that, well, f- because of because of all those different options, people are going to choose the sa- the safest route, which leads I agree. to yeah um, the fighter becoming Babby's first character. Oh, I'm not familiar with that reference. You know the basically the, basically the idea of standard fighter of the of somebody's first somebody's first character going with the simplest thing that isn't going to require oh, as much thought. Sure, which sure. Leads to pe- leads to this idea of you only pick fighter because you, because um you're new, because you're a rookie. Totally, yeah. I mean, who wants to play like <laughs> like a wizard in D anD D for first campaign? <laughs> <clears throat> you know, by comparison, at least. So. Yeah, this idea of it being the that of it being the system mastery um class. Hmm. Which isn't which isn't exactly the case, but that's the narrative yeah. that's been put forth. Yeah, I I also just think like tabletop role playing games are by nature complex compared to video games, where like even with Baldur's Gate three, which just came out, and I love in part because it doesn't really explain a lot to you; it kind of lets you play around with it, and you can learn by doing, but that's still a huge help over tabletop games because, you know, whereas you can learn by doing in Baldur's Gate, um, you can't just, like, click buttons and see how it works in eternity, right? Like, you have to actually understand the game first. Same with D&D, of course. And so, the in a sense, the, the simpler the game is, um, the more accessible you make it, then I, I feel like it, it just... It's like a gift you're giving to anybody who's playing it for well, the first time. I so. will always warn people that simplicity is a pendulum, and sure. you can sw- you can swing too far the other way. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah, I I think like what we've gone for in eternity is like introduce the bare minimum number of concepts at each stage of the game, and then once you kind of get a grasp on that, more is introduced. Mm-hmm. So the eventual point where you know there is just like literally probably thousands of options where you can dive in and do what you want to do um but it, it, you don't you're not just dumped there at the start of the game you know where you're like what the like what do i do mm-hmm. so yeah and the this the analysis paralysis will always be a thing but you can mm-hmm. limit it um, mm-hmm. But a lot of people have this have this idea of have this um, very linear idea of simplicity good. Which sure, sure, it can it can be, but um, that but whether whether you're going simple or going complex, they each of them has their own costs. Right. Uh, of course, going too simple, you end up you end up with a whole lot of what what the hell am I, sp- with a lot of right. um throw, throwing people into the pool and saying swim, right, um, right. But speaking, but speaking of um next one next one on the list is the thief. Um, yeah, I should have thought of one before this. Uh, like, I mean, probably like. Black Widow. Yeah, I could. Are you familiar with the Thief games back on the PC? Uh no, actually, I've never played them. Oh. I don't think I've ever heard of it, even. Now that I'm thinking about it. Yeah, that obvious. Obviously, with a name like Thief, that that would be applicable. But I'd also say the Prince from um, Prince of Persia. 
Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I would agree with that. Even if he, even if he doesn't, um, po even if he doesn't poison, and of course I could al always bring up Locke from Final Fantasy VI. Yes, definitely. Even th even though he would hate me ca calling him a th calling him a thief. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the more one of the more interesting concepts in the class list that you that is in there is the. Um, next one, the Vampire Mage. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> there's a, I mean, you know, I mentioned at the start how I've been making games for a long time. And part of the goal with Eternity was to keep it, you know, something that people are familiar enough with mm. to give it a shot, right? Like, I mean, I feel like every, like every game has a Berserker or a version of it. And then there's some that are a little bit off the beaten path, like the Royal Guard. And then there's like the Vampire Mage, which, I mean, realistically is in a lot of games. This would be like a Necromancer. Mm. Um, but it's one that has a lot more unique lore to it. And, you know, it, it's uh, it's one of my favorites. I think it's super fun to play. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the last one is the um, Vanguard. Yeah, so this is the one that I think is the most fighter-like. Um, there are mechanics within the class to encourage players to switch between weapons because you gain bonuses by doing so. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, this would be like more of a mobile fighter. Maybe it uses a spear and uses like hit and run, or they switch to like a bow and arrow. So maybe like a Robin Hood kind of character, I guess. I'd I'd say I'd say they're what rangers are supposed to be. Yeah, that's a good way to that's a good way to say it. Yeah. Uh, and since you're since you're not assuming dungeons, you don't have that problem. Sure. Everybody right. talks about I... how in current D and D rangers are have have had a run of bad luck because they've been redesigned three or so times. Oh but, man. Um. This is nothing new for rangers. They've all, they've always had a they've always had a bad time of things because they've never been able to establish their own niche. Yeah, you know I I can relate uh, in designing a ranger like class for whatever reason. Uh, it, it's like a really hard one, but I feel like we've nailed it now. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it was one of those that I also had to go through many iterations and for some reason. I know a lot of people say, "Well, ju just utilize Aragorn or, or Legolas for making a ranger," and I'm like, "No, those are n those are not the best template to use." No, no, they're not. <laughs> um, instead of those, go with Rambo. I could see that. Yeah. You know, because because th I've some people have waffled back and forth. I've I've always arg I've always argued against. Having rangers be half casters, mm. uh, largely be, largely because I feel I feel like the clo the closest argument for it is them picking up a variety of of tricks through their experiences. Sure. Problem problem is um, when your classes and jack of all trades are oil and water. Yes. Yeah. Hundred percent. You know, you you can you can you can do a jack of many trades, but mm -hmm. a generalist a generalist character doesn't really work in cl in classes. It's about as ridiculous as having a jack a jack of all trades um, position on a sports team. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, <laughs> it's it's hard to even answer in a way other than that. Um, so. In previous editions of Eternity, over the many years of playtesting, mm -hmm. we had gone at one point with something like a Skyrim sort of system, where there was like a just a talent tree, and you could kind of go wherever you wanted. You know, your like quote unquote level ups were just experience points you could use to purchase stuff. Um, and I mean, that's a little bit different than a generalist, like what you're talking about, but. What I find in these kinds of games when people have the ability to just get whatever they want is they all end up getting the best things because people are really smart. 
and they figure out pretty quickly what the quote unquote best things are, and then they just get all of them. Um, it's funny you mentioned Skyrim because even with all the freedom of of skill that Skyrim offers, um, uh huh, and th and this wasn't a problem previously because in the past you had a class system that you that you could um, use to limit yourself, right? Um, everybody ends up playing a stealth mage archer. Yep, <laughs> you're just fucking everything. <laughs> You're just, you're just those three things because, well, yeah, yeah, you could you could be a f a fighter, but the problem is melee combat in the Elder Scrolls has always sucked. Mm. And I and no, I don't think it's because it's in first person. I've seen games do first person melee combat well. Yes, same. Oh, uh, well, Machin X did it did it perfectly did it perfectly fine back on the. A writ back on the original Dreamcast. Mm. Oh, and that was in 2000. But... I, I think the game's even like Fable that I feel like are a little bit better. Well, but, Fable's yeah. third person, so I can't count that. Oh, yeah, yeah. My, my bad, my bad. I, sometimes I just zoomed in a lot, I guess. Mm. <laughs> and... Grant, granted, it has the, it has the unfor it has the misfortune of being made by Peter Molyneux because because no one else because no one else wanted to be Peter Molyneux. <clears throat> but even but even with that, I can kind of see the DNA of that freeform setup because of the um because of the because of the way th um abilities can be upgraded. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. You know, with the with the fact that they can be upgraded with those th with those three symbols, and right. the amount of ones you have for each deter can grant its own benefit. Yeah, and what we're gonna do also to allow more options uh, for there's gonna be you know levels eleven plus. Currently, the game goes to one through ten, which that's a full campaign right there. But in the epic levels eleven plus. Uh, people will have even more options to sort of customize their characters with some multi-classing options and then uh, individually upgrading spells and abilities mm -hmm. um, so that, you know, they do more of how you imagine them uh, to be doing in battle. So th there are ways, I think, in games to kind of hit both, kind of, kind of back to your point of have the simple and then have the complex. Yeah. And how do we bring those together? Uh when it comes to when it comes to multi classing, um, is yeah. it gonna be a case where you're taking levels in other classes or is it gonna be a a more pick and choose affair? Yeah, so what's gonna happen is you'll get like four levels in uh one other class of your choice. All four have to be in that class, but you can just pick and choose from any of like the you know, any of the spells or abilities available regardless of like the level requirements. Um, and then you'll just get like one spell and ability from like anywhere, um, any other class. And so there's still still limits in it, again, to the point of like not becoming Skyrim where you're just good at everything. Um, but giving more flexibility too, so that as you learn the game and you like different abilities you see, you, you can really, you know, customize your strategies and your, you know, uh, role play usage of spells and abilities as much as you want. Really? Mm -hmm. So, um, I know I I know I said I was only going to focus on the main class, not any of the expansions. Sure, but sure. But one of the expansion classes is a monk, so I do kind of have course. to ask about that. <laughs> sure. Um, have you ever played a uh, grand class melee? I think, think I have. I think have you? I have. Okay. okay, it's like on the Xbox. Um. You like pick a character and then you just like duke it out and then like <laughs> you'll have your choice of like upgraded classes and then you just do it again and there's like eight rounds of it. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so there's like this class in there where you just it's called Kai Beam is your ability and you basically just like Dragon Ball blast people across the map. Uh, we basically added that <laughs> and then plus like kind of your traditional like monk class. So. They are magic-like, um, multi-striking, 
I mean, it's it's cool. It it would be like the high fantasy version of like a kung fu movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, although, since since you're mentioning game references, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up God Hand. Oh, I don't know that one. Uh, God Hand is a very has a very customizable um, setup when it comes to your move set. It is also mm-hmm. very very bonkers. Uh, as in, as in, kicking somebody so hard that they exit the atmosphere. Yes, I'm all about it. Oh. Sounds great. Or, or set, or setting up a kick and then, and then, and then doing a fake out and kicking below the belt. Nice. <laughs> oh. Or, ha- or having a, having a, having one of its villains, um, be a, be. Be powered by a giant battery on his back. Ooh, nice! Yeah. Oh, you know that that style of of um. This makes no sense, and we don't care. Right. Yeah. You got to have a little bit of that. So I, I would say that's probably accurate in some senses. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But and and even even with it, I know I know that you have it where. The get where the game it where um, world creation is on a bit more of a collaborative um, setup. Sure, but within expansions, do you plan on having like a get like a gadgets here setting to give people an example of what they c- could do with that with that format? Yeah, yeah, we definitely will. So there's going to be an expansion that's just like called the you know lore expansion, and it'll have not only you know a list of more things you could just take and use for your own ideas um but it'll have you know examples of if you want to create your own kind of here's how our process goes um yeah there there's a in the original printing of eternity which was like five years ago or something we actually had all of that in the same book but i wanted to you know, again, part of the simplicity idea. I think the current rule book length is like 168 pages, which is still a bit intimidating to a lot of people. Um, but we cut that down from like 350 pages or something. So that's where a lot of that lore <laughs> will come back in. Um, again, it'll be like a pretty, pretty reasonable, pretty low price even um, for expansions. So I just mm-hmm. want people to play in the game, really. Yeah, I can, I can certainly get that. Yeah. And with the, with that in with that in mind, uh, within the within the expansion, what when do you when do you suppose you'll you'll have um you'll have public tests of that available? It's a great question. Um, so currently, we're getting the main rulebook. Uh, professionally graphic design for the first time, which is great. I think that will be, the graphic design will be done like before Christmas, but I think the artwork that goes along with that will take a little bit longer. So I, I say all of that because you know, the expansions will come after. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would like to have at least one of the expansions available for people to just, you know, try it out uh, next year, maybe by like summer at the latest. Mm -hmm. I could, I could, I could certainly see that. And I, I do find it kind of amusing that you put a, you put a class quiz on the site. Oh yeah. Yeah. um, (laughs) Have you gone through that? Um, I think I, I think I have once, I think I have once or twice. Sure. Yeah, it was uh, originally when we would do like Comic Cons, you know, we just have QR codes at the table and it would be like, hey, instead of us telling you about the game, I mean, we'll tell you a little bit, but why don't you just do this? And then um, it was a way for people to kind of learn about the game while answering questions and seeing what kind of class they might like to play. Um, So it's still available on the site. For anybody who wants it, it's mm-hmm. it's pretty fun. It takes a couple minutes, um, and uh, I'm sure we will update it. One thing I really want to do is have like 
a graph at the bottom when you finish that actually shows you how many people have gotten each class um, because there's definitely some that get picked a lot more than others, which could just be fun to see, I guess. Yeah. And of course, having a char- I think more games should have an on-site character creator. Yeah, yeah. Um, Eternity, as far as numbers goes, is much simpler than many games. Um, instead of having like 30 HP, you'll have like four. Um, but there's still a lot of depth with it, and so we did put together a, a character creator where anyone can go on there and you can sort of see how the character building and leveling works. Um, and it'll even calculate all the numbers for you based on the race you choose, items, etc. Mm. And then you can print out a PDF um, so that, you know, you can just say you want to try like a one shot adventure and you, you're not sure if you want to commit to playing a full campaign of eternity you could build a character on that, print it out, you're good to go. Oh yeah. And of course of course of course the it's also a good way to get characters out there quickly because well sometimes yeah. sometimes you might have a newcomer coming in and you need you need a pre gen yesterday. Yeah, yeah. Good point. I hadn't thought about that, but you're absolutely right. Yeah. I remember saying I said something not far off when Shadowrun introduced the priority system for character creation in um fifth in Shadowrun fifth edition. Mm. Uh, the idea the idea was ranking several aspects from a, from A to F and that determined what you would end up getting. The sure. essentially the budget for those particular aspects whether it be whether it be your choice of meta type, if you had access to magic or not. Um, what's what budget you had for skills, for advantages and disadvantages, that sort mm. of thing. Now, mm-hmm. obviously, obviously, it's not a one, it's not a one on one to one thing with what you have here because Shadow Runs technically um, pretends that it's classless. Sure, sure. You know, you can you can te- you can hear the sarcasm. Of course, yeah. <laughs> um. But with, the, and of course, of course, some um, within the within the setup that you have, um, I think one of the, one of the interesting things to no- to note is the is trying to put in a AI system for um for not ju- not just classes but also also ju- also just a Rec- recommended action set setup. And yeah, the, yeah. The the I, only major game I can think of that tries to implement some sort of soft AI is um, Emberwind. Okay, yeah. Um, I <laughs> I love a lot of video games and a lot of tabletop games. Mm. Um, so this is like. I'm going to give a critique about World of Warcraft. Doesn't mean I don't like it. Um, just to be clear for everybody, but one thing I don't like about World of Warcraft is when you're attacking a monster, it just feels like you're attacking a stat block. Like it doesn't do anything. It just hits you back at a certain amount per number of seconds. That's it. And so, what I really wanted was for a way. Uh, for people to sort of create their own monsters, of course, that goes along with the world creation, story creation that anyone can do with Eternity. And so you can basically assign a class to a character, say that you're fighting a dragon. Maybe it makes sense for it to be a pyromancer, or maybe it makes sense for it to be, I don't know, a berserker or something totally off the rails, whatever you want. So that, that soft AI will sort of just tell you, like... On turn one, this is what ability you do. Um, turn two, you do this. <laughs> kind of keep it simple. Uh, and it is a great way to learn the different classes of the game as well. Um, I, one thing I'd love to do in a future version of Eternity that's online, which we plan in the, you know, down the road, is I um, really want a game where people can't go on to like 
making their own blog or a forum and they just say, here's the optimal build for playing a pyromancer. You get this ability, this item, this setup and specializations, and now you're the best, right? Because I think that takes all the mystery and fun out of the game. So just on the topic of AI, what we plan in the future is to have like a thousand variations <laughs> of like every spell and ability that's in the game now to the point where people have to develop their own ideas and use your own creativity because, you know, the meta build, quote unquote, that somebody else has, you may not even have any of those spells or abilities yourself. And so um, just since you're on the topic of AI, I think that's one way that we will actually use AI in the future. So, yeah. Well, we, and of course, of course, some. I think I remember you mentioning that you plan on you plan on um, ad, on adjusting or get or getting or getting some more art for the core book. Yeah, yeah. Um, so our artist is just incredible. She has class icons for uh, every class in the game, just about so far. But she wanted to redo a, a few of them. Um, with the publication coming out and the print runs. Mm -hmm. And then she's also doing some full page art um, depending on schedule, but definitely at least one for the cover. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, I think the artwork makes a huge difference for mm -hmm. people. So <laughs> everybody everybody loves really great art. So Yeah. And I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how it develops. But I appreciate it, man. With that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. Yeah, I'm so grateful for the invitation. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As awesome, I often man. say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. I'm very, very grateful. Thank you so much for your time today. Yep. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>